qualitative mass spectrometry for proteomics and metabolomics. Tomorrow we are talking about image analysis and flow cytometry. The following day we talk about biological pathways and networks and then we're out. So just three, three more days and then you're, I hand you off to the tender mercies of biostatistics if you're in my division. Okay, I, I actually don't know what comes next for uh, the folks upstairs, so we'll find out. All right, so today we are talking lecture F, quantitation in proteomics and metabolomics. How do we quantify using mass spectrometry more specifically? I have borrowed a lot of slides from a lot of people here, uh, particularly the content on the XCMS algorithm. I borrowed very heavily from slide decks that Paul Benton and Gary Susie have made available, uh, so I really appreciate uh, what they were able to give us. We could lay this out in several different ways, uh, but I'm going to structure it uh, in a way that we're, we're going to talk about a very basic strategy for differentiation in proteomics called spectral counting. It's a relatively easy method for people to understand, but from there, the rest of this is all going to be about chromatograms. We're going to discuss selective reaction monitoring, which is a class of experiment that's very good for targeted quantitation. We will discuss uh, untargeted discoveries in uh, metabolomics, specifically uh, using the, uh, the XCMS online method. And finally, we'll talk about how we make sense of the, the spectra. How do we identify a, a differentiating metabolite uh, based on its tandem and spectra? And for that, we'll talk about the METLIN database, which is tightly allied to the XCMS online. And finally, we talked just a tiny little bit about flux, but uh, we'll get there when we get there. So we've already shown you this, uh, this plot. This is our, our last day on this chart, though, because we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about chromatographic time alignment and peak integration. This peak integration is really the, uh, the part that, that ties most strongly to uh, a chromatic, the definition of chromatogram. From there, one of our applications is flux analysis. We'll barely touch that one along the way. We will have a little bit to say about spectral library mention as well. This is the principal method by which we identify metabolites. Let's start with spectral counting, though. When we have looked at proteomics data, which isn't really extensively in our practical this year, um, one of the things that we can measure is how many spectra have matched to a particular protein from a particular experiment. So if you imagine a five-on-five -five experiment, you might have 10 raw files, and you might ask how many spectra have each of those contributed to our identification of a particular protein. This is the spectral counting method. But why on earth would that work? Why would that be useful for us to determine whether a protein is differential or not? So I, I want to start by, by giving you the sense that a, pe a peptide is associated with a probability of sorts. Will this peptide be identified in this tandem mass spectrum or not? So we start with the fact that trypsin likes some places better than others. Trypsin may cut the same bond with 90% probability in that protein, and yet another peptide with uh, another location for trypsin to cut in that protein may be cut only 10% of the time, because some proteins are quite hard to unfold, for example. So just so some peptides will be produced with very high probability and others with very low. A peptide next must compete with others in order to be ionized. And what's the rule about peptides if they fail to be charged in mass spectrometry? They're invisible. So we have to get a peptide produced by trypsin in the first place, and it must be ionized to be visible to the mass spec. But even if you have a peptide ion available to the mass spec, it's still competing for attention from the mass spec with lots of other peptides. In the sweet spot of the liquid chromatography run, you have far more peptides eluding from the column than the instrument can meaningfully sample at one point in time. So even if you do have this peptide generated through trypsin and you do have it ionized, uh, it may be that that, in, that ion is not intense enough to be selected for tandem mass spectrometry. So uh, the other part is even if you have a tandem mass spectrum generated, you may fail to identify it with a high enough score that you can keep it. So the peptides are really in competition. And when we think about a, a protein, we should realize that it's got a bit of an iceberg. Everyone's seen the, uh, the, the iceberg metaphor, I think, that if you have a little bit of ice poking above the surface for an iceberg, you don't really know how far down it goes. 
And in the same way, there are, part, there, there are component pieces of this protein that are visible, those that are very high probability peptides, and then there are lower probability peptides that could also be generated from this protein. So if you have a lot of some protein, you're likely to have a greater chance of seeing more of these lower probability peptides. If you have a vanishingly small amount of a protein, you may see only the most probable protein, uh, the most probable peptide from it. So when we are trying to decide whether a protein is differential between two cohorts, we would ask essentially how many distinct sequences, how many distinct peptide sequences are we seeing for this, for the, this protein? So that might be a straightforward superset thing, where all of the peptides observed for a low concentration version of a protein, uh, that, that a superset of those plus more are seen in another experiment where there's more of that protein present. So think of this as an iceberg sitting high or low in the water, and, and we're getting a different look at this depending on the quantity of that protein in the sample. Because peptides are in competition, we assume that given an overall complexity that's the same, seeing more spectra for a protein is a pretty good proxy for saying there's more of it present. All right, this was actually kind of a controversial paper when it came out, it came out back in 2004. Um, but over time, a lot of people have, have buttressed this method and shown that it's actually quite effective for detecting proteins that are different between pairs of cohorts. So we expect then that more concentrated proteins will match to a larger number of tandem mass spectra when they're abundant than when they're not. If the same protein is observed in different samples, the number of spectra that match it are predictive of its relative, of its relative concentration. And shotgun experiments cause ions to compete for MSMS -MS selection, favoring abundant proteins. So if you've got a lot of subprotein, compared to a situation where you've got just a little of that protein, you should be able to tell the difference based on the number of spectra that match to it. Okay, so what do these look like? I, I think we've already spent enough time looking at microarray data sets that this probably looks sort of familiar. Does this look sort of familiar? Before, we were looking at a bunch of floating point numbers that represented intensities seen in a microarray for a particular probe. Everyone remember that? That was last Thursday. In this case, however, we have counts. And this reflects the fact that a spectrum either does match to this protein or it doesn't. It doesn't really make sense to have 13.34 uh, spectra for a protein. As a result, we've got integers to work from. Now, these are data produced in the Proteome Informatics Research Group 2009 study for an organization called the Association for Biomolecular Resource Facilities. I'm actually going back to this meeting for the first time in years. Uh, this, uh, this April. So here we have five red replicates for E. coli and five yellow replicates for E. coli. We generated these at Vanderbilt, produced the tandem mass spectrometry data ourselves using our, our orbitrap velos, and then we passed around the raw data to anybody who wanted to take part in the study. And we asked, how, uh, what proteins are differential between red and yellow? That's a straightforward question, right? But everybody had exactly the same input data. So why would their answers have been so wildly different? Well, I think that's a fascinating question. It, it, the fact of the matter is that people have a lot of statistical approaches for dealing with data of this sort. And some of them were more effective and some of them were less effective. And some people really surprised us by not going the spectral counting route at all. They went with an approach we'll look at later when we get to chromatograms. So, what this means is that a protein of this particular accession number, P0A6N8 from E. coli, has 47 spectra that match to this protein in the first replicate, 60 in the second, uh, 55 in the third, etc. So when we have a particular row out of this table, we need to be able to either overturn our, our null hypothesis that there's no difference between the means, or accept it and say, well, in fact, there is no difference between the means. So given these data, we need to have a statistical approach that is appropriate to counts, not floating point numbers. When we work with t-test, t-test is always going to assume that our data are continuously distributed. 
which means that it would be possible to have an answer like 45.68, for example. But that doesn't make sense here. Our numbers are not uh, continuously distributed. They are integers. They're counts. And as such, t-test is not really the right way to deal with these data. We've already violated a very major assumption of the t-test, which is that the data will be continuously distributed. So t-test is right out here. So how do people deal with these? The numbers are integers. They're not floats. And as such, we need to have tests that are appropriate for that. Now, the first of the tests on the screen right now is the Fisher's exact test. If you spend time in, uh, in statistics classes, you may remember the lady drinking tea story, which is about a time when R.A. Fisher met a woman who claimed she could tell whether the milk was added to her teacup first or the tea was added to her teacup first. He thought this was a wild, a wild idea. How could you test whether somebody really did have the preternatural ability to tell whether the tea was added first or the milk was added first? So he designed the Fisher exact test as a way to answer that question. Now, I'm not going to get into the particulars of it right now, but it's built around the idea of a contingency table, which is to say that we ask how many spectra for this, uh, how many spectra match to this protein in this sample, how many spectra match to other proteins for this sample, and for the other uh, the other set of, of uh, experiments, how many spectra match to this protein from those uh, runs, and how many match to other proteins in those runs. So it's just a four-way table. But for, and, and one of the things that I think is really important to point out about Fisher exact test is that it ignores replicates. So here we have a five-on-five -five comparison, but to use Fisher exact test, we would probably sum all those five replicates together on either side and just treat it as a red versus yellow problem. So it's kind of shocking. We've grown accustomed to this notion that you've got to have three replicates on either side before t-test can be used, etc. The t-test is not the right test to use here anyway because they're count data. And, in fact, you can put together very sensible answers about whether a protein is differential or not, even boiling all this variation, uh, the variance information out of it by doing it in a contingency table. So Fish's exact test is kind of a quick and dirty way, then, to compute these p-values. Now, I also want to point out that although it's frequently called the lady drinking tea test, <laughs> terrible name, the, I want to point out that it's not just a lady. She was a co-researcher of his who happened to be a woman. And the test showed that she really could tell whether milk was added first or tea was added first. So she got the last laugh on that one. All right, uh, let me see, what was her name? Muriel, oh gosh, I knew this. Muriel Bradshaw? She, it's in my lecture on the subject. So anyway, Fisher's exact test is a really handy test to know when you don't have replicates and you just have count data. Uh, so it, it's really valuable for you to know about it. All right, next up, Poisson modeling. Poisson. Does it, has anyone heard the word Poisson before? Poisson, Poisson? No, no, that's not right. Poisson. What's it mean? It's French for the word fish. Poisson. But it's actually a name in this case. And Poisson modeling is a really handy thing to know about in the case of integers like this in count data. So Poisson gives us a better way to evaluate the variance for a collection of numbers. If you think that uh, the variance you have in a bunch of floating point numbers is just directly mappable to integers if you're wrong. In fact, when we have counting data, we frequently find that the variance gets bigger as the count gets bigger. So one of the, the kinds of questions that we see uh, used with Poisson distribution is something like the, the burnt out light problem. When does, uh, how frequently have you seen a light, a light bulb burn out in your life, an incandescent light burn out? A few times? Some of us have seen it happen. Generally, what happens is that I walk into a room, I flip on the switch, there's this bright flash and a pop, and I, and I, I jump a few feet, right? That's because turning on the light is that moment when most incandescent lights are most likely to burn out. So one of the things that you can think about is that Poisson is a really good way to estimate how many times you may uh, enter a room and flip on the light before it burns out. How many, how many light switch flips is a light bulb rated for? But we expect that there's this bigger variance in it depending on the, the, the scale of that number. So frequently, when we see people using things like linear models for dealing with these data, they'll use a Poisson model 
which you can see has this broader variance as the value of k increases, so pretty narrow at k equals 1, fairly wide at k equals 3, pretty darn wide once we get out to k equals 9, etc. that we can use Poisson models to estimate variance as a function of magnitude. These linear models link to Poisson, uh, the Poisson function to evaluate the count data it's making sense of. So Poisson has become a very popular model in the context of uh, spectral count data like these. I've highlighted a paper from Choi et al. in uh, 2008. Uh, this is a pretty popular system that people use for making sense of this, uh, produced out at the University of Michigan. So in brief, spectral counting is a pretty basic system. Most people do not use this to say there's 1.6 times as much of this protein in red as there is in yellow. You don't generally see people using it that way. But people will use spectral count data to say uh, that with a p-value in such and such, we don't believe that this protein is present at the same levels between these two. Therefore, this is a difference. Okay? It's a different kind of statement to claim that something is differential rather than saying it's quantitative. To, to put a, uh, a type bound on a thing and say there's somewhere between 1.3 and 1.9 times as much of this protein in this cohort as in this cohort really requires a much, much more carefully designed quantitative experiment. And that's really where we're going with this lecture. But for now, spectral counting is a simple way that we can ask what changed. Any questions so far? From here, we're going to lurch right into chromatograms hot and heavy. All right, let's do it. Chromatograms. Chromatogram is definitely a key concept for this. Uh, we're going to have another image of it in just a minute. But for now, I would like you to, to, to think to yourself that chromatogram is our, uh, our visual record of how the separation took place. Most generally, when I'm talking about chromatograms, I'm talking about mass spectrometry. So I may have a, a signal that's, that's measuring all of the analytes over time, or I may have a signal that's measuring the intensity for just one particular peptide. I use the same term for both, but I tend to call one that sums across all analytes as the total ion current rather than the chromatogram for one individual ion. I'll try to keep really clear which of those two meanings I'm, I'm working with it at a time. So here on our horizontal axis, we have time. Ultimately, this chromatogram is a, a record of intensity as a function of time for either a set of ions or one ion in particular. So here we have an analyte B that comes off early, produces this nice intense peak. We have another analyte A that pops off at this time, at time, time 2, and a third analyte that pops off at C. One of the things that differentiates the, the, the elution of C to A and B is that C has a much wider peak. So the chromatographic separation achieved for C is much lower than what we have for A and B, which are nice and tight peaks. So this morning when we were looking at a peptide solution, I think we said that it uh, spanned a space of um, 24 seconds. It was an estimate of around 24 seconds. Imagine that you had another peptide in that same run that had an elution time of three minutes. Stuff like that happens. So uh, elution profiles are not always these nice sharp peaks that we would like in chromatography. Okay, so the record of intensity with respect to time is a chromatogram. And this is another nice image produced over in Wikimedia Commons. When you're trying to figure out what, slide, what images you can include in your talk, always think about uh, those that you can get for free. Open clip art is also good. Okay, now, one of the most substantial tool sets out there for making sense of, chromat uh, of chromatograms in proteomics is MaxQuant. MaxQuant is uh, the 500-pound gorilla in this space, really. So let's start with an image of a mass spectrum. Here we have our mass to charge axis. Here we have our intensity axis. This is actually real data for once. So here we have a peak at 468.31. Here we have 469.31. Here we have 470.29. So I'm going to ask a hard question that on its face only is hard. What is the charge of the ion we're looking at? 
I'll tell you that's positive. It's positive. It's not zero. We wouldn't be able to see it at all. It's plus one. One, exactly. Right. How do we know it's plus one? Well, what we're looking at are isotopes. These are isotopes. So there's some amount of the carbon in this ion that's carbon 13, and there's some amount of it, uh, some amount of this peptide that has two spare neutrons, probably two carbon 13s or an O18 or something. So what we're seeing then is the spacing of the isotopes, baseline result. This is a beautiful, beautiful separation. If this were a plus two, these isotopes would appear one half m over z apart. Do you see why? Because in mass over charge space, adding one mass unit at a plus two charge adds only plus 0.5. So if this were a plus two, we'd expect to be here and here and here and here possibly, if it kept going. If this were a plus three, we would expect these isotopes to be even closer, only 0.3 apart. Peak here, a peak here, a peak here. So one of the things, one of the tricks that we so frequently use in, in proteomics is to see how far the isotopes are spaced from each other in order to infer the charge of it. This is one of the ways that a very high resolution mass spectrometer allows us to infer not only the m over z, but the mass because we can just divide out the charge to get that value. So that's quite handy. This is what a single time slice looks like for this particular plus one peptide. Now, how does that look when we start looking at this over multiple scans? As I said, this is one single time slice. So you can imagine that deep into the board, we go into earlier and earlier time points, and going this way, we go into later and later time points. So, if this is only visible for 30 seconds and we take a scan every 3 seconds, we have only about 10 slices in which we can see it. So if we were to look at this in a different axis, we're still looking at m over z, but now we're not using intensity. Now we're looking at time slices. So in moving from about uh, 72 and a half minutes to 73 minutes, we hit the sweet spot on this particular peak, and it stands out more and more, which is why it goes to these darker colors. We also see that the accuracy with which we know its mass improves slightly uh, as we get a strong enough signal to really pick the middle of that peak well. But as you see, it's got some persistence through time. You can even do like a 3D reconstruction of it. Now, if we were to do this for the whole isotopic packet, we would be looking at not just the carbon-12 peak, the monoisotope as we call it, but also uh, the C13 peak that's got one extra neutron, or the C plus, uh, the M plus two peak that's got two extra protons. So Max Quant makes the judgment that we know more about peptides, more about proteins, than the simple count of how many spectra we're seeing for it. Imagine if, imagine that spectral count is just like what Max Quant does, except that it adds a one every time a spectrum has been attributed to that protein and adds a zero if not. But Max Quant has the ability to integrate the space, to find the volume of this, of this peak in three space. That volume is a scalar, it's, a, it's a, a floating point number that we can use to represent how much of this is present in this particular experiment. And then imagine that you have multiple experiments. Uh, this morning we were looking at Coke versus Pepsi. We had three replicates of Coke, three replicates of Pepsi. If we found a metabolite in one of those files, we could look at the same patch of retention time and mass to charge in another experiment to see if it also had a peak. Okay, so this is a, a case in which we have different areas observed for the same peptide across experiments. So Max Quant has the ability to learn from the fact that it saw a peptide identified in this experiment, that even if it wasn't identified in this other experiment, it can find the same locale, the same mass to charge and retention time space, and integrate a peak there if it happens to be available. So now we can get ratios. We can say that for this peptide, we had this intensity, this intensity, this intensity in the reds, and this intensity, this intensity, this intensity in the yellows, which gives it a much more finely grained ability to pin down a ratio for a protein at different, uh, uh, in different experiments. All of that is based upon chromatograms.
Now, I, I have to say, Max Point is not my favorite software on Earth. I think some of the claims made with it are outrageous. But that's still not, that's not to say that this software should be ignored, because it must be considered. This is one of the most standard workflows that we find in European and, Af and African proteomics at this point. So it's best that you understand what this software can deliver for you. All right. But here's the tab rule. If you're going to do a quantitative experiment, if you want a quantitative result, do a quantitative experiment. And for that, selective reaction monitoring and targeted proteomics are the best way to go. So let's start with the fact that interesting proteins are very rarely the major ones in your sample. If you are doing a bunch of biofluid proteomics and trying to locate biomarkers, I'm going to wager that uh, the top 100 proteins, the top 200 proteins that you can find in blood are of very little interest to you. Fibrinogen, okay. Hemoglobin, okay. My blah, 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 blah. The whole list here. These, these major proteins change very, very little in the context of biofluid proteomics. So if we're going to go exploring in this space, if we're looking in biofluids, it's much, much better if we have a target list. We have a set of proteins that we think from external evidence will be interesting in blood. Then we can create a targeted assay that provides us much better data. Okay, so shotgun methods are great, but their ability to identify peptides consistently is not really their strength. I did an, a, a paper a few years back evaluating the repeatability when you shoot the same sample, same complex sample, yeast guts in this case, many, many times on the same instrument. And you know, one of the things we learned is that you see a different set of peptides every time. There's no number of experiments that you can do where if you do the n plus one, you won't see more peptides than you've seen before. This is a, a vexing problem for a lot of us. That's because the universe of peptides from which shotgun proteomics is drawing is so vast that uh, generally there's no end to the number of, of sequences you might possibly see in a sample. So if you shoot the same sample uh, 100 times, maybe you've got a pretty good notion of what's in there. But if you shoot five replicates, you probably don't know all of the peptides you could potentially uh, draw from it. So any given peptide is probably going to have a pretty low probability of detection associated with it in shotgun methods. If you target that peptide, if you say, I want to measure this particular subset of peptides, you're going to get much more robust information uh, in response. So, uh, I put on a little warning note here at the very end, and it's, a, it's worthwhile to mention. In the old days, publishing shotgun proteomics uh, was fine. You could run six of, uh, uh, five of these and five of those and publish your paper and everyone was happy. Over the last couple of years, many proteomics journal, uh, journals have come to the realization that these, this type of biomarker discovery almost never validates to another site. And so when people are publishing biomarker studies, proteomic differences in biofluids, for example, they are almost always required to have an orthogonal study that quantifies these differences in a new cohort. So I do a bunch of shot netting over here. I find these proteins I want to claim are differential. I design a quantitative targeted proteomics assay around them. Then I use a different cohort of samples to evaluate whether these, claim, these putative uh, biomarkers actually are differential in this new context. It is a very difficult uh, criterion to hit, and I have to say it's been a bit of a chilling effect for a lot of people who'd like to publish a bunch of A versus B studies. So these days, if you want to prove that these two cohorts are different, you'd better start with a shotgun experiment and follow up with a chaser of selected reaction monitoring. So what is selective reaction monitoring? I've referred to it a few times. Uh, we've talked a little bit about time of flights and about uh, quadrupoles and, uh, and uh, Fourier transform mass analyzers. Let's talk about one of the most straightforward instruments that's been around for decades at this point, the triple quadrupole mass analyzer. We have an ion source, we have a detector. So we are we're creating an electrospray uh, spray of ions, a, a continuing stream of these ions that are available. We're going to sub, uh, subdivide these, uh, these instruments into three quads, for obvious reasons. 
These have four poles, these have four poles, these have four poles. This is called quadrupole one. This is called quadrupole two. This one is called quadrupole three. So Q1 is set to pass only ions that have a particular precursor mass to charge value. Okay, so if you know the mass, of, the mass to charge value of the peptide ion that you're going to measure, this quad is set to pass only that. Anything else hits the electrodes and falls away. Next, we set this to be a collision cell. So the only job of quad two is to stabilize anything flowing through it and better the heck out of it. We're going to bounce it off of noble gas atoms. It's going to cause whatever peptide ion that is to break into fragment ions. And finally, quadrupole three is set to pass one and only one uh, one and only one fragment ion mass to charge value. Correspondingly, this, this signal that gets detected by the electron multiplier at the end is going to represent how much of this particular transition passes. A transition is a particular combination of a precursor M over Z and a, target, uh, and a fragment M over Z. So by returning to this particular configuration of the instrument, as a, a function of time all the way across this experiment, we're able to produce a chromatogram that shows that not only was an ion of this precursor mass present, but when blasted apart, it produced a fragment of the correct M over Z as well. So this morning in the practical, I suggested that we set aside fi uh, 50 proteins we wanted to measure, three peptides for each, and three fragment ions for each. What that means is that this triple quad must cycle through 450 different combinations of precursor mass to charge and fragment ion mass to charge. So it's got a lot on its mind. It's flipping through all of these transitions all the time for the space of the 90 minute experiment. At the end of which, for each of these individual combinations of precursor M over Z and fragment M over Z, we have a chromatogram. So that is the selective reaction monitoring experiment. It takes advantage of the fact that these instruments can switch between different uh, combinations of precursor and fragment M over Z in much less than a second. The workflow in general is, is quite a lot like the other. We, we still uh, have to digest our proteins into peptides. We're still going to use liquid chromatography to separate them and electrospray ionization to create a flow of peptide ions from it. But here we have our Q1 screening out everything but the precursor uh, mass to charge value. We're still con conducting collision induced dissociation. This takes place in the second quad. And we're still going to screen out everything. Uh, we're still uh, using the third quad here to, uh, to specifically uh, select one particular fragment that we're measuring at this moment for this peptide. So what comes out of this is a bunch of chromatographic traces. And because we're choosing multiple fragments we're measuring for each peptide, we have multiple traces that correlate well in time. Because if you think about it, that peptide is only showing up at some particular 30 second interval. And during that 30 second interval, you should see all of the fragments rise up and all of the fragments fall back. After you've integrated these to get peak areas, you can compare those areas and start making judgments about the relative intensity attributable to this peptide across different experiments. So what does this look like? In practice, we want to measure multiple fragment ions because at base, we want to see their interrelationships. We want to see them be correlated with a, with a particular retention time. Uh, now, I would note that the ion we went looking for at Y7 here, at 731 this is a, a particular fragment we're looking for for a particular peptide, we see that it actually has a bigger signal out here at 50 minutes. So why are we saying that the peptide is over here if we have a bigger signal over here? And the reason is that we see these ions moving up in concert at this later point. We're measuring five different fragment ions, all from the same peptide, and they all jump together at this time, at just before 52 minutes. So when we look at these data, we draw the conclusion that this peptide as a whole 
is coming off here, despite the fact that we've got some other jags up and down in these samples. So you might be asking, why would you get a signal jump? Why would you get a chromatographic jump in some place where this peptide isn't coming off? And the reason is selectivity. The, the instrument is not able to uh, allow through ions that fall only within 0.1 of your target M over Z value. It's got to let things through that are within, say, 1 M over Z of it. And just coincidentally, there are a lot of uh, fragments and uh, precursor ions that happen to fall in these same locations if you're dealing with something complex like a biofluid. Okay, so these chromatograms are the output of selective reaction monitoring. We, we use these integrations of correlated fragment ions to get a quantitation for how much of this peptide is present here versus there versus there. Helpfully, um, some of the diaspora of different software packages that characterizes protein identification is actually quite a lot simpler in the world of selective reaction monitoring. Because there are really just a very small number of packages out there that people routinely use for designing and analyzing these experiments. Skyline is the one that we looked at this morning. You can find lots of information about it there. Um, the, the creators of the tool set have even recorded videos to help you understand how to use the software, how to design experiments, how to evaluate uh, uh, the quality of your workflow, etc. And it's obviously quite graphical in nature, which makes it relatively easy for people to work with. It's not one of these command line tools that vex people so much. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at things like retention time variability for individual peptides. So here we have five, uh, five different peptides that are being monitored. And here we see the, the range of retention times at which it was seen across these five replicates. So these are pretty well-behaved peptides in this case. It also uses a pretty good interface for organizing the data. So the, the way I structured it, you have these proteins. From it, you're going to see these peptides. For each peptide, you're going to see these transitions. That same kind of model is used and you, as you design your experiments as well. So calibration curves are something that we have to think about because we're doing quantitative uh, analysis here. Calibration curves are not specific to mass spectrometry in any way, shape, or form. We're borrowing from the same ideas that everybody else has been using in this. For example, when we run Luminex uh, samples uh, uh, up on the fourth floor, uh, we, do, we also have to generate these calibration curves on each plate. So calibration curves show up all over the place. And I really decided that, that we must include a full slide just on this, uh, this topic because it comes up so frequently. When your instrument says that uh, there are 50 picoliters of, of something there, why do you trust it? Generally, an instrument has some sort of detection method. If you were using a UV cell, the brightness of, of uh, fluorescence might be something that you were measuring. If you were working with mass spectrometry, intensity is what you'd be measuring. If you're working with Luminex, you're getting, again, fluorescent intensity that you're working with. But in order to relate these quantities of light, or quantities of uh, electrical current in this case, we need to have some way to pin a, a, a reporter value, an intensity in this case, to some quantity. And that's really where calibration curves, also called standard curves, uh, come into play. So on this axis, I'm showing the log of the known peptide concentration. In each of these samples, we've spiked in expon and exponentially more of the sample. So in, in one uh, old experiment that we did, we had one uh, unit uh, spiked into the first, three in the next, nine in the next, 27 in the next, 81 in the last. So you can see that this was a three-fold increase at each step in how much of the sample we were loading into the mass spec. And then we ask, what is the measurement that comes back from the instrument in response? So here we are looking at actual data. Uh, these came from uh, Jeff Whitaker's paper back in 2011. But lots of people use standard curves, so you can find these all over the place. I wanted to give you three definitions that come along from this, uh, and we'll try to walk through those. The first of these is limit of detection. Limit of detection is something that we struggle with quite frequently, uh, especially with like, Luminex instruments. 
you may have a uh, uh, you, you may find that this low limit, the, the tiniest amount of sample that you've spiked in, produces no signal in response. That the instrument simply says there's no data for this sample, for this, for this analyte. This is a, a common occurrence when you have uh, a concentration that's below the limit of detection. So you can imagine that in this case we might have even more concentrations down here that simply had no data produced. There was no peak to be detected. The next is the limit of quantitation, though. Most instruments will have something that we describe as the linear response, response range or the, uh, the range of linearity. You'll see different names for it. Where putting in more sample leads to more signal. Everything, everyone would like to see that kind of relationship, right? You put in more sample, you get a higher reading. But, as we see at the very bottom end of this, we have some small amount of these samples that we've shoved into the instrument, and it says, well, there's something there, but I can't really put a number on it. And this is kind of awkward. So this part falls outside, lower than the limit of quantitation. It's outside the range of linearity. At this point, this instrument is doing quite well because we see that as we increase the, the fold of how much sample is getting introduced, we also get an increase in the log amount of signal that comes out. So this range of linearity tells us the range of measurements we can dump into this instrument and get useful feedback from. All right, so lots of kinds of quantitative technologies make use of this concept, and I really feel that like everyone here should know what limit of detection and limit of quantitation are all about. All of your experiments need to be in this linear response range if you're going to rely on their quantitation. So one obvious problem that you can run into here is that you may have a huge signal in one case and a non-existent signal in the other. So what would you say is the fold change for a case like that? Who really knows? Because one side uh, of our, uh, one, one of our cohorts is below the limit of quantitation. Therefore, putting a ratio on it becomes quite difficult. I made the quip earlier that mass spectrometrists frequently call themselves the masters of the x-axis because our, our intensity values can be rather hard to pin down. Fourier transform instruments routinely give us mass to charge values that are accurate within 10 parts per million. That's a pretty routine kind of operation for these instruments. Our intensity measurements, however, are frequently built on sort of a, a logarithmic detector, meaning that we, we quite frequently are relying on the collision of ions with an electron multiplier to kick off a cascade of electrons that produces an intense, a, a, a voltage that we can actually measure in the detector. So this means that we may have quite a lot of variability in the, uh, uh, in the in intensity measurements that we get from our instruments. When we've done research studies that share common samples across multiple labs, each using their own instrumentation, we find that accomplishing something like a 10% coefficient of variation is typically about the best we can do with uh, selective reaction monitoring experiments. Now, CV is a term that crops up an awful lot, again, not just in mass spectrometry, so I thought it would be valuable for you to know about that. Uh, when you see the variance of this, you can find its standard deviation. Once you know a standard deviation, you can divide that by the mean. That will give you a coefficient of variation. So if you think about it, this 10% number I'm giving you means that if you have these measurements, they've got a wiggle in them of around 10%. That's survivable. Is it as good as we would like it to be? No, 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 we would like a 1% CV. Because remember, your ability to detect differences between cohorts doesn't just depend upon whether the means are different, it depends on where the, whether the variabilities are small. Standard deviation, sorry, the, the coefficient of variation is one way to quantify this degree of, of bouncing around, of the noise that our signal must overcome. All right, now we're about to move into the fine world of metabolomics. I thought I would pause for a question. People feeling pretty good? I think you're probably feeling better than this coffee or tea, whatever it is. Would be. I, I should be able to tell, right? Yeah. 
metabolomics. The metabolomics world finds itself in sort of a similar position to that of proteomics, except that there are so many different worlds of metabolomics that you might live in. If you're living in the, the world of small volatile compounds, or the world of phospholipids, you're probably using altogether different kinds of instrumentation and different kinds of software workflows. But they still have this sort of uh, paired reality. We have been talking about targeted proteomics, and we see that targeted metabolomics is quite the same. They also rely on things like selective reaction monitoring, and they still use uh, all kinds of uh, LCM SMS uh, methods for, for doing this work. So the, the things that I've told you about looking for a particular set of peptides for each protein and a particular set of fragments for each peptide, those all hold true for metabolomics as well. But sometimes you don't know which metabolites are interesting. And for that, using an untargeted approach is much better. Uh, so this paper from uh, 2012 and 2016, uh, they both have a lot of value in explaining this distinction. So how do we go about sniffing these samples to find what's changed? So the, the whole workflow tends to look a little like this. This comes from a, uh, a multi-part series I did a few years back to try to explain to people who are getting started in metabolomics what to expect. So we start with the fact that we need to do peak picking. This is something that shows up all over the place in proteomics especially, but anytime you're dealing with mass spectrometry data, it's probably going to be an issue. So if you have a peak shape like this, you need to be able to put a stick on the thing and say, there's a peak at this location and it has this intensity. So for something like that, we, we call that process peak picking. That's most frequently handled with a toolkit called ProteoWizard that I was really heavily involved with. Next up, feature recognition. Uh, we spoke this morning about X, the XCMS pipeline giving some number of features for a data set. And this comes from this feature recognition. In the world of proteomics, we would expect to find a set of isotopes relating to the same peptide uh, showing up at about the same time and going away at the same time uh, and being spaced by, the, uh, by one over the peptide charge. So that's an example of a feature for, mass, for proteomic mass spectrometry. But you may have features that have a different isotopic pattern in the final world of metabolomics. Next, retention time alignment. These are all elements that we're going to sort of work our way through as we go, too. Uh, and so I'll come back to retention time alignment. But the idea here is that we have a little bit of variation that creeps in to liquid, chromatograph uh, liquid chromatographic separation. And if we can adjust those errors away, it becomes possible to say, we have a feature at this particular retention time in this file. Do we also see it in this other one? Can we match features that are seen in both of these to be the same analyte? Okay, so retention time alignment is key for that. Some ability to differentiate matters. Uh, so being, being able to put some statistical tests on these features that, that you've mapped between runs to say, um, there, we can put a p-value on this, that this is not present at the same concentration across all of these experiments. Those things really matter. So this is a, where statistics creep in. But I want to point out that here at the very end, we suddenly have identified the biomarkers. So this is backwards, right? We're, we're, I'm accustomed in proteomics to identifying everything, find, and then when I find a difference, I already know what protein it is that differs. But in this case, the identification step comes at the end, and this reflects a find what differs, and then focus all your attention on just those. All right? So I, finding the peaks that differ, we can then follow them up with some sort of identification process. So I'm going to certainly come back to talk about retention time alignment and identifying biomarkers. So XTMS Online is one of the most widely used toolkits here. Um, as you see, they have thousands of users who've, who've uh, created identities on the site. It's free, uh, and so you can just log in to use it. They've produced a whole snow of, of, uh, of publications about this, and as you see, over the years, the number of users seems to be growing more or less exponentially. So, when we talk about a region of interest, I want you to think back to that slide I showed you early on about MaxQuant with the big green monster peak. So here we're looking at the same thing, but in sort of a, a different light. Again, we're looking at M over Z, and we're looking at time. Now, if this were to be a chromatogram, I would need to show you the, the intensity as well. And here you see it, boom, down here's, the, here's our seconds, and here's our intensity. 
So instead of doing a fancy schmancy 3D plot, they've shown us two different perspectives on the same thing. Here you see that the, the M over Z of the peak uh, is holding more or less steady while it's in this really intense range. And you can see that it's wandering back and forth in this space of about 20 ppm. So these may be, for example, QTOF data, which have that kind of mass accuracy. We see also, and this is something a lot of people don't seem to appreciate, is that when you get to very low intensities, your mass measurement also tends to go awry. So if you're trying to pull an accurate mass to charge value off a peak of very, very low intensity, you're likely to have more error than if you can spot it at a high intensity. It's just a signal to noise thing, really. So here we have our intensity as a function of time. Here we're looking at the, very, at the uh, amount of wobble that we have in the crest of that peak. So that region of interest gets boiled up as a feature within uh, that, that, uh, within that raw file, within that uh, WIF file that's from a, a SIX instrument. Now retention time alignment is a little bit complex. Um, I don't know that I really want to pound on this one too much, but I will note that dynamic programming is one of the, the routes that we use for this. We've, we've actually seen dynamic programming before. When you were looking at uh, how systems like Smith Waterman and Needleman Wunsch uh, align two sequences, I showed you an M versus N box with a bunch of uh, a bunch of values in it showing where we could get a hit between the two sequences and where we couldn't. So we had to trace a line through that to optimize our score. Dynamic programming shows up again here uh, as we try to map the features that we see in one experiment versus another. So here we've got our two spectra coming in. We're able to find how those align to each other. Essentially, well, let us, uh, just to give you one simple example, imagine that you saw A in this, uh, in this experiment a couple seconds before you saw B. If you saw A before B in this one, that would also help you. There's no way that distorting the second experiment so B comes before A becomes possible. We can smush time, but we're not going to reverse it in this process. So there's only one sort of walk you can do through these, these two retention times being aligned beside each other that will optimize the, say, the, the uh, sum of, of squared, uh, sorry, the sum of, uh, of the products of intensity across that. So you're going to have to have some metric that you're using to score how good an alignment of A versus B, uh, of experiment one versus experiment two can be. So we try to find that through dynamic programming. I shan't go much further into it than that, I'm afraid, but uh, you, you can learn a whole lot more about it from this article in 2006, and the authors really do try to be helpful. Okay. Now, I mentioned that figuring out which peaks differ really matters, and XCMS understands that a lot of the experiments you do are going to differ from simple one cohort versus another cohort problem. So when we do a two-cohort comparison, yes, they certainly have tests that are ready to support you. You can see that things like the independent t-test or Welch t-test are included. Sometimes you do paired experiments, and paired experiments are covered here. Sometimes, however, your data are a little, um, they're exploring the space a bit more, and you may not have normally distributed data to work from, in which case something like Mann-Whitney becomes helpful. Now you've seen students t-test and Man whitney before. We talked about them on the microarray day. So Man whitney tends to be very robust against outliers. The t-test is a little better, especially when you've got very small numbers of replicates, like if you've got a triplicate versus a triplicate. Uh, we also make use of things like one-way ANOVA. Imagine that you have uh, three different kinds of infection, maybe an attenuated strain of MTB, uh, H37RV and uh, BCG, for example. In something like that, you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you're comparing every pair from that. If you instead model that as a one-way ANOVA, where infection is one of three types, the software can guide you through it much more uh, appropriately. So when you have more than two independent groups, working with one-way ANOVA is very helpful. Uh, right. There are also equivalents of ANOVA that are also non-parametric, and this Kruskal Wallace is an example of that. And helpfully, they have all these lovely visualization tools.
Now, we, we mentioned one of these this morning. We were looking at the cloud plot. The cloud plot here is their, is their fill-in for the volcano. So we're, we're not losing the information about where in retention time this difference was found. We're able to separate uh, the changes in each direction by whether they appear above or below the middle line. And as I mentioned, the size and color of the circle tells us how firmly we feel about the, the p-value and about the fold change associated with that difference. So it's the same kind of information as we present in a volcano plot, but it's spread out differently to accentuate where in the experiment that was. Sometimes we have things like uh, our ANOVA experiment. So here we see that a p-value has been computed from, I believe, a five-way, sorry, a, a one-factor, one five-level ANOVA, where we have wild type versus four mutants. And we can see that we can compute box plots for this particular biomarker across each of these different stages, uh, each of these different uh, mutant, mutant types. So it's, it's quite nice to be able to interact with your data in this way. And they've, they've tried, certainly, uh, to design their statistical tests in a way to protect you from making false claims uh, to avoid false discoveries. Because things like Benjamin E. Hochberg multiple test correction are built into the software framework, as you saw when we looked at the table this morning. When it reported Q values, those were Benjamin E. Hochberg corrected P values. So that's grand. We, we've talked a little bit about alignment. I realize I was much less than clear on that subject, but uh, it's hard. What can I say? So we have uh, we've talked about the statistical systems we would use to detect uh, the markers, the, the the features that most differentiated these samples. Finally, we need to talk about how we go about identifying them. Now, Metlin is the identification side to XCMS. XCMS is going to handle all the statistical processing and the, the alignment, etc. Metlin is going to be useful for uh, identifying it. So Metlin is a spectral library. I want to point out spectral libraries have a pretty long history, really. If you've spent any time in the GCMS world, you probably are familiar already with the use of spectral libraries as a way to determine what this spectrum represents. So uh, libraries of thousands of different metabolites have been, have been created for this purpose. Metlin, though, is trying to go with larger compounds, and it's really emphasizing uh, LC-MSMS. So instead of having GCMS where essentially the, uh, the compound itself is exploded and you don't really get its intact mass per se, here we, we probably know the, the mass to charge value of the intact ion as well as the fragments that result from it under CID conditions. And we see that the number of different compounds is above 10,000 already, and the slide is obviously a bit old now. But I want to point out that the number of spectra, oh sorry, that the, uh, the number of metabolites in total that make it in here is quite a lot larger, um, 20, 20 times as many. Um, and that's because some of these have been paired with tandem mass spectra and some have not. So in cases where you, you know the mass to charge value of something very accurately, maybe its elemental composition and its retention time, you can go pretty far with identification, but we really prefer having tandem mass spectra because once we know the intact mass of the thing and its fragments, we have a much greater grip on what its identity is. So what is a library? A spectral library is a collection of spectra, but it's not just any spectra, they're annotated. These individual spectra are, uh, are the snapshots of what happens when this gets blown up. And in the case of Metlin, uh, these, were, these were generated in the laboratory uh, of, of uh, Gary Susiak himself. So, the, uh, so when you're looking at a spectrum library entry, you have the list of fragments that were produced for this ion, its intact mass, and you probably even have some sort of annotation to say this fragment represents this part of the molecule having broken apart. So it's, it's quite powerful. If you have a spectrum that's been seen in the past for this ion, and you collect a new tandem mass spectrum for it, comparing the, new spec the newly observed spectrum to the one that's been seen in the past is one of your easiest ways to get its fingerprint to say, ah, this is that ion. So where do these come from? This is kind of an interesting story. I, I have asked in the past to be able to download uh, the, the, the whole of Metlin so I could do some evaluation of the, the quality of the clustering, etc. But Gary turned me down. And the reason for it is that Gary produced these uh, these spectra in collaboration with chemical companies. 
And one of the conditions of, of that process was that he gets to, use, to incorporate these spectra, but he doesn't get to distribute them. Okay? So he had access to a lot of molecules that he wouldn't have been able to get if he hadn't been in partnership with uh, the corporations, but those data have pretty limited um, uh, distributability. So you can only use Metlin, in, in essence, if you're willing to send your tandem mass spectra to this web server for automatic detection. And it will automatically run through the uh, existing library of metabolites to see whether your spectra get a hit or not. So what do these entries look like? This is an example of the annotation. This is one that has a tandem mass spectrum as well, but we'll, we'll sort of uh, skip over that. So here uh, we're looking at caffeine. Presumably this cup has some in it. Okay. So uh, we have our, our molecule right here. This is what caffeine looks like. Everyone would recognize caffeine, right? We have it on t-shirts and stuff. Okay, well maybe not yet, but it'll come. But it'll come. So we see that uh, Part of his partnership with the different chemical vendors means putting their logo in there and explaining how you two can purchase caffeine directly uh, from the vendors. Uh, we see the elemental composition, which is very useful when you're trying to figure out how the intensities of the, uh, of the isotopes should compare. We have the systematic name, 137-trimethylpurine-26-diene. Would any of us before today have recognized that as caffeine? Caffeine's a much friendlier name, I think. All right. Um, and we see that it has a keg number. Keg is going to be pretty important to us as we move into pathways and networks on Wednesdays. So just remember, we saw keg here. And it's got a pub chem number, 2519. So you can learn all sorts of interesting things about it. All right. On we go. So how does the software figure out that the spectra you've observed, that you've sent in as your query, looks like this entry from the spectral library? Most frequently, the answer is built around dot products. How do we explain dot products simply? I, I, I struggle with this one again and again. So I, I would ask that you imagine for a moment uh, spectra that have only three different M over Z locations. They have some intensity for position one, some intensity for position two, and some intensity for position three. I want you to imagine that this desk represents the corner of a three-dimensional space. We all okay with three dimensions? We're going to say we are. So we'll say that the intensity in position one is up. The intensity in position two is this way. And the intensity in position three is back towards the board. So if you had a spectrum in which all three of those intensity values were identical, we would be moving the same amount up as we are this way, as, our, as we are that way, to get to the point that represents this one spectrum with these three intensities. Does everyone see that? This is the diagonal of that, I'm on the diagonal of a cube here. So if you had three intensities and they were all identical, they would put us out here. Now what if I had another observation of that same spectrum, but it was at much lower intensity? Well, it wouldn't make it as far out into this three-dimensional space, would it? But they're on the same line because the three intensities are, are equal across the three. So what we do is ask, what is the angle formed by one of those vectors compared to the angle of the other vector? I said vector there. What, what did I do? I just threw us into vector space? That's right. We're talking in multi-dimensional space. We've got three intensities. This one is far out here. This one is far out here. It is less far because it's a low intensity. But if I'm, if I'm computing the angle of the vector pointing to this and the vector pointing to this that starts at this corner of the desk, what is that angle? Elevation. What's that? Elevation. Oh, what, what is the angle between these two? So you, I want you to just imagine, imagine that there's a laser pointing out of that desk and the tip of it is touching this finger after passing through this finger. No, we're, we're, I'm sorry, you, so you're saying like 60 degrees, that would be saying that I'm trying to compute the angle from say a level point up, but I'm not. I have two, I have two vectors, one pointing to this fingertip, one pointing to this from this same point. The lines are right on top of each other. There's no angle there because 
it, there's a zero, degree, a zero degree angle between the two. They're both pointing. I'm sorry, do I have my fingers misaligned here? There we go. There's no angle between them. It's a zero degree angle because both of these have equal distribution across those three points. Now let's, let's shift one of these. Now this spectrum is actually giving us zero intensity on one of those three bins and all of its intensity is concentrated in two. Now we see there's a, lot of, there's a much bigger angle between these two, right? So if they've got their intensity distributed the same across all the locations, they have almost no angle. If the intensity distribution changes, you start to see an angle between them. All right, now that sort of worked in three space. I'm sorry, I, I realize that probably it's too much to try that after lunch. I, I, I feel that way. It happens. <laughs> but I would point out that if you have a very low angle between vectors of three points, that's an indication that their allocation across those three locations is the same. If you have a large angle between them, that's a suggestion that the way they distribute their intensity is quite different. This model really only works if I've got three locations that can hold intensity, but a tandem mass spectrum has more than a thousand places that could potentially have intensity if it's a high resolution one. So in spaces like that, you have to deal with being in a thousand dimensional space, but the math is not actually different from this very straightforward, relatively straightforward, uh, 3D case. So you can still compute an angle between vectors even when they have a thousand dimensions. The math is the same. So we use dot products in order to compute what this theta angle really is. Um, and if you'd like to see some of the many, many ways that these angles get employed, uh, you can read this paper that I read all the way back in grad school. Uh, Steve Stein uh, is, is definitely a leading light in the, the space of spectral library identification. So uh, this article from 1994 is very, very good. It explains the math of that. Yes, sir? So we use the angles to differentiate between two, let's say, different elements. Two different spectra. Yeah, so if you treat the spectrum as a series of dimensions instead of a series of m over z values, um, where the intensity seen at an individual m over z is its distance from the origin on that dimension. Um, the, the angle just represents uh, how much these two diverge from each other and how they allocate intensity across those dimensions. All right. Do you, okay. Do you have the same spectra for different elements? The, these are not elements per se. These are these are compounds. Yeah. So one one spectrum for caffeine that's in the library, and one spectrum for caffeine that we've uh, that we've collected on our instruments. Oh, so. Okay, I was trying to say, can we use the angles to differentiate? Okay, if it's this angle, that means this is caffeine. If it's that angle, that means this is proper something proper. Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, you can. You can imagine the whole spectral library as a, a, bunch, a, as a thousand vectors, um, each one tagged with a, this compound is X. And then say, which one is closest to this experimental spectrum that we're comparing against the library? Okay, I realize that was a bit of a mind blow, I'm sorry. Uh, but the short version is that spectral, spectral contrast angles are one of the, uh, the most widely used methods for determining which spectrum in a library is most similar to this experimental spectrum. If you understand that, you're already in a pretty good place. Read the article, you get the math, and the, the, and the rest of it is, is history. So. But for now, just keep in mind, spectral contrast angles or dot products, the same thing two different terms for the same thing, are both methods that we, that these, this is the, the method that we use to evaluate whether this experimental spectrum is a particular compound out of the database. Okay. And if you thought the math was hairy there, just wait till we get to flux balance analysis. So, we frequently think about biochemistry as a uh, as diagrams like this, the biochemical pathways on the wall here, we see all of these long, uh, long pathways involving lots of different steps, and along the way we have a particular enzyme that mod modulates this step, and another particular enzyme that modulates the next step, etc. If you have a mathematical mind, 
you might create a mathematical model of a particular synthetic process and ask, how much GTP do we have as an entry point to this? How much of this, uh, of this possible product are we making? How much of this downstream product do we have? Mass spectrometry can allow you to measure um, many products along a chain, for example, by doping in uh, a little bit of heavy carbon uh, to monitor the products that are produced in response to that as time passes. And flux balance gives us one of the ways to try to solve for all of these equations and understand which, uh, for example, when you have a branching pathway in biochemistry, which one is being favored under a particular series of circumstances. Stuff like this is particularly useful if you are working with cell culture and are trying to produce a large amount of uh, transgenic product in something. So if, for example, you're trying to manufacture antibodies in Chinese hamster ovarian cell lines, CHO cells, you probably want to know how much of the glucose that you're dumping into this thing is being used in manufacturing that product antibody rather than growing a bunch of new cells. So flux analysis is one of these ways that we try to, to analyze all of these flows through cells to understand which reactions are being favored or disfavored under a particular condition. So uh, this, this article from 2010 might be a good place to start to understand uh, what we, uh, what's been accomplished in this space. Certainly, um, lipidomes have sort of fallen in a gap of sorts. Some people feel they don't even belong in metabolomics, and they certainly don't belong in proteomics. So a lot of people have just said, well, they must be their own field. They must be lipidomics of their own, own accord. I think that's a little unfair, uh, because in a lot of respects, lipid tandem mass spectra are, uh, are a very fertile place to work uh, for, from a bioinformatics perspective. We've only written one paper there, but uh, it, it's something that I think is very worth talking about. Um, we think of identification processes as being particularly useful in the context of things with sequences. When we look at sequence database search for proteomics, we see that knowing the sequences of the proteins is everything to our understanding how to identify peptides. Lipids, of course, don't really have sequences. Um, but, the, but there are a, a, a finite number of structures that these lipids can take on. If you think about the PEs or the PSs or the PCs, you, can, you, you know what the head groups are. You see that there are two places to attach fatty acids. And there's a small number, relatively, of individual fatty acids that may be attached to either of those points. So lipidomics is, I think, a space that has a lot of real possibilities for exploration. Um, and certainly, it, it has a lot to say for us in the fine world of, mass of, uh, of um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, because mycobacteria use a lot of lipids to mess with the host system. So it's kind of uh, valuable to be able to analyze those as well. So I, although I've spent a lot of time talking about metabolomics as this kind of separate space that also makes use of mass spectrometry, don't forget that lipids are still here, and there are a world of data sets out there for people to work with as well. So mass spectrometry intensities bounce around a fair bit. There's always a little bit of variability associated with it. But as you have seen today, I think, chromatograms are, are not so noisy as to be completely unusable. In fact, we found that we can, we can infer chromatograms successfully from shotgun data sets, certainly from selected reaction monitoring, and even in other workflows like SWAT that we sort of sampled this morning. Those, those mass spectrometry intensities in the form of chromatograms are very valuable in the context of pep peptides and lipids and metabolites. They're all biological ions at that point, and so measuring them through chromatograms is certainly feasible. Identification, however, is a kind of a messier problem. We rely on spectral library search for metabolites to a much greater extent than we do in proteomics. Um, and trying to identify a novel compound can be very challenging indeed. So I, I hope that in, in coming from this, you see that there are a lot of different ways you can quantify within, within uh, proteomic and met metabolomic mass spectrometry, and you have some vision of what kinds of challenges um, come from the identification uh, challenge. OK, uh, so with that, tomorrow we're talking about imaging. Uh, so biological imaging and flow cytometry I look forward to having that chat with you. Uh, we'll have a, a 
a, a tutorial in the morning at 9 o'clock as usual, and then we'll be back here for our quiz at 2 in the afternoon, and a lecture, of course. So I'll see you then. Thank you.